Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast for this uh, special commemoration of last year's October 7th terror attacks in Israel. Uh, Adam, Jonah, and Charlotte, thank you uh, for joining this discussion. Uh, I think actually this panel uh, brings together three different interesting perspectives, all uh, worthwhile to hear from kind of different different you know parts of how you would feel feel on that day. So I kind of just want to start with uh, initial thoughts. Charlotte, you were on the ground, uh, I believe, on October seventh in Israel. Um, what was that day? Can you just tell me how it unfolded that day and what were your initial thoughts and and when you realized the scope of what occurred, uh, how that felt? Yeah, I was not on the ground in the south, but I was in Tel Aviv. Um, I woke up that morning when Hamas started firing rockets at central Israel around 6 a.m. I'd moved to Israel about a month prior to report for the dispatch, so it took me a minute to even kind of process what I was hearing um, with the air raid siren and then go into the stairwell of my apartment building. Yeah, I knew that a Hamas rocket attack was unexpected in the security establishment of Israel. I'd spoken to a lot of people about potential threats from the West Bank, from the North with Hezbollah, but overall the prevailing belief in Israel was that Hamas was deterred. So the rockets in itself were pretty surprising, but really we didn't start to realize the magnitude of the attack until the reports of the ground attack started to trickle in. And that's when we realized it was different than the 2021 Gaza war, for example, which was mostly just cross-border rocket fire. I think a lot of Israelis look at the moment when um, they saw Hamas fighters in steroid on a pickup truck in a traffic circle. It's kind of the moment that people saw, okay, this is something completely different. Um, and of course, we didn't even really have a sense of just how many people had been killed or kidnapped until days later. Adam, you are Israeli, family in Israel. Um, what was your reaction, initial reaction to the initial reports, and then when you realized the full scope of what occurred? So uh, I think it's true, the way Charlotte is putting it, that this is something that we couldn't really have anticipated and yet fully anticipated at the same time. Um, I think I think I mentioned this to Jonah when we spoke on the remnant, uh, basically the day of October seventh, that this is kind of the worst case scenario that every Israeli goes to bed with, imagining this kind of invasion, imagining the brutality that will be unleashed on Israeli civilians in the case where Israel's own defenses fail. And at the same time, we either you might either by means of emotional psychological repression or by delusion either way not great qualities we've convinced ourselves that it, it is also impossible so at the same time we were sure that we are safe and knew that we are absolutely not and this is what happens when the wall falls so when we started hearing the reports about um and i was in new york at the time my reports were trickling to me around 2 a.m. I ignored the rocket barrage because that it's, oh, it's, it's been two years since the last one. So, okay, it's, a, it's about time. But when we started hearing about actual Hamas commando forces, the Nukba infiltrating, not one or two terrorists infiltrating the kibbutzim, but, but dozens, hundreds entering and that there has been no ability to withstand that invasion something i think clicked in the mind of every israeli who grew up um in the second intifada who had those paranoia who had this paranoia already embedded realizing that this is it this is the thing we've been terrified of and we have completely failed to to hold it. Now, at first, we didn't know the scope of the the horror. I remember, I think, on uh, at the time of recording the, the the remnant episode on October seventh, we were discussing maybe three hundred dead and fifty people um, taken hostage. So that's the scale that we imagined. But the moment we heard that the the border failed, that there is no resistance from the IDF, and that the um, 
forces unleashed from Gaza are um, um, real militants and not merely a, a lone wolf terrorist. I think we all realize that this is going to be gruesome because those are not targeted military tactical attacks. Those are death squads that have just been able to cross the border. So at that point, we were all just waiting to to hear just how bloody, how horrible it is. And I think at the same time, like I said, all Israelis just clicked with the understanding that this changes everything. Because now that we have crossed that Rubicon of the horror that we have been um, repressing in our nightmares since the Second Intifada, now that this has actually happened, we are turning a page on what Israel looks like, how Israel responds to her enemies, and what does it even mean to exist in the new power balance of the Middle East. Jonah, I think you have a, a similar background to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. I have one Jewish parent, one non-Jewish parent, uh, but deeply identified with Israel, identified being Jewish, uh, traveled to Israel uh, extensively throughout my life, followed uh, its wars. Um, what, what, was, what was your reaction when you fully understood what, what occurred in Israel? Yeah, so... Um... Similar backgrounds. Uh, I was raised Jewish. My dad insisted on it, so I was bar mitzvahed. But my mom insisted that we hang a sign that says "Santa's no Santa knows we're Jewish" on the Christmas tree. Um, so I, uh, me too. I was similarly raised, but we had uh, we celebrated Christmas and other things. I don't know if you did as well, but kind of yeah, somewhat similar. I mean, we, we we didn't call it a Hanukkah bush, but that was sort of the spirit of it. Um, and um, so, like I. I it was a Saturday, right? And so, like, I cannot begin to tell you how reluctant I am to follow the news on Saturday mornings. Um, but I started getting I – saw, I saw on Twitter. I started getting text messages from friends. I don't know when Adam and I started texting or when he started putting stuff in Slack. But that was um, – it was pretty clear pretty early that this was serious. But I don't think anyone really had a sense of how serious it was. And so when I started following it, at first I started following it as a sort of with my conservative pro-Israel pundit hat on, and I was hate watching MSNBC, you know, and watching sort of Ali Velshi, you know, trying to both sides a pogrom in real time. And I, I, I will put it this way, it annoyed me. And... um and then it made me very, very, very cross. Um, and to me, it was, I, I kind of like the way Adam put it about how it was a totally surprise and also totally expected um, in, in, the, in a sort of um, Schrodinger's cat kind of way, right? It's sort of like every, everyone knows. We've been talking about it since we were little kids, um, that there's going to be a big earthquake in California one day. But when there is a big earthquake, everyone's going to be really shocked by it. And I think similarly, there's I think there's going to be a debt crisis. I mean, there are lots of these things that we are they're very predictable. We just don't know the timeline on. And what made this especially different was the way I kind of thought about it was is it's one of these things that if you were to describe it in advance as an abstract thing to people, and then you were going to it, to me, it's I don't want to make light of this or make this a partisan thing, but it's a little analogous to the Trump stuff. You know, if you were to describe some people's reactions to the Trump things in 2014, you say, okay, here's what's going to happen. This guy's going to do this. He's going to say that, all that kind of stuff. And here's how you're going to respond to it. They would get very, very angry with you for doubting their commitment to principle and their, you know, opposition to bad character. Similarly, if you had described to many of the people who, who were celebratory, of what was happening on 10-7 as it was unfolding, and certainly in the days and weeks after, you said, okay, here's what's going to happen. A bunch of people are going to uh, invade Israel from the south. They're going to rape and murder a bunch of people at a concert. Um, they're going to kill children in front of their parents, parents in front of their children. They're going to kidnap all of these people. And you are either going to defend it or do this sort of anti-anti-Hamas thing. They would say, how dare you? Of course I would be against that. And so for me, the horror of it, as, as palpable and, and as, as terrible as it was, 
one of the things that was much more lasting for me was the sense in which there were just a lot of people out there who are safe and comfortable in the Western world who claim to want peace and be supportive of Israel, but also want a two-state solution and all this kind of stuff, who for reasons of groupthink and tribal solidarity and popular frontism and a bunch of other things, um, felt it was necessary to take the side or make apologies for or minimize for minimize what would be utterly recognizable in the abstract as unadulterated evil. And I think that's one of the things that has, has fueled a lot of polarization is the, on the topic of Israel in the country. I think it's one of the things that, you know, getting to sort of the ramifications of all this, that sense among very liberal, secular, westernized Jews in America, that holy crap, there are these people and these institutions that have no moral clarity about this kind of stuff. Um, I think that's going to have a very long tail culturally, psychologically, politically in the United States. And it's, it, to me, it's one of the most remarkable things other than the, you know, the obvious evil and brutality of it all. I think I actually want to take that question to you, Jamie. I think there are, the way I talk about this with friends, we always see two different traumas in this event. I hate the word trauma, but two, two different moments of psychological shattering. And the first was on October 7th and was the total failure of the Israeli state to protect its civilians. And I think that's something that we are still grappling with and trying to explain to ourselves. Just to, as a reminder, people in real time as their towns were being invaded, they were calling the news channels, they were calling journalists while they were being besieged and and murdered because they weren't able to reach any law enforcement. They weren't able to reach anybody to save them. So they were literally calling TV channels to ask for help. So that moment will Israeli society will be reckoning with for years to come. But the day after, October 8th, is the second moment of shattering. And that is what Jonah is talking about. And I think that is the realization of just how lacking in moral clarity so many people seem to be where they would go on the streets protesting about Israel's culpability in its own pogrom. And I think that, I mean, I was surprised to see you, Jamie, take a very strong um, position on it publicly because you're, it's not like you're, you have a very, um, or at least in recent years, you haven't have been particularly eager to engage in Twitter uh, wars or in, in fulminating combat, but that did bring a lot of the, the, a, a lot of rage from you. And I just want to hear how October 8th impacted your view of the media of American politics. Well, you know, I, I think it shattered a lot because I actually didn't think that type of attack, <clears throat> I couldn't imagine that type of attack happening in Israel. It's kind of the scariest thing you could think of. Uh, roving bands of terrorists without any IDF in sight, doing what they want at will. And that border, that southern border, you know, had been that fence there 100% effective since they built it on the Gaza Strip. Um, so it kind of shattered. I, I couldn't believe that occurred here. And what, to what you're saying, what was most surprising is that it shattered my own safety in America in some sense. The idea of Jewish safety in America, I never really had a moment of fear for myself as a Jew in America. And what's strange is why would the greatest attack since the Holocaust in Israel make me fear for self in America, which has been previously safe for me? And I, I know there's anti-Semitism everywhere, but, but I never felt under threat in America. And it's to your point is that almost immediately after the greatest attack on Jews since the Holocaust. You see not solidarity with Israel, there was that in, in many quarters, but a greater outpouring of attacks against Israel and siding with the other side immediately. I mean, the calls against, I mean, if you go back and look when people were saying Israel's committing genocide, it wasn't, you know, two months later, it was like within a week, they were accusing uh, uh, Israel of genocide after being attacked. Um, and, you know, that was shattering which, you know, I have on my, my notes here, and I would be interested 
in everyone's perspective, particularly Jonah, because I think, you know, I, I remember growing up, my dad would tell me my dad was much, uh, he was 50 years older than me, he passed away about a decade ago. But, but uh, so he, he grew up in the, the 40s. And he remembered uh, going to Hebrew school and people calling him a Christ killer and, and throwing stones at him. But I never saw any of that experience. Um, in, in The Atlantic, uh, Franklin Foer wrote a piece shortly after September, uh, October 7th, the golden age of American Jews is ending. Anti-Semitism on the right and left threatens to bring to a close an unprecedented period of safety and prosperity to Jewish uh, Jews in America. Uh, I wonder for everyone, particularly Jonah, who kind of grew up in the same age, what do you, what do you make of that? Do you, do you find that thesis compelling? And, and why do you think the greatest attack on Jews since the Holocaust in Israel would cause this bubble of Jewish safety in America to end? It doesn't really make sense to me, at least. On yeah, paper. I mean, we, very similar experience. My dad had a couple stories of very mild anti-Semitism experiences. Like, he couldn't believe it when his best friend in college said to him, you know, don't Jew me about this. He's like, what? You know, that kind of thing, right? Or, and of course, the Irish and the Italians and the Jews in the Bronx gave each other crap, but that's more like West Side Story kind of nostalgia than than anything like anti-Semitism. Uh, my own experience with anti-Semitism has basically mostly been online and in print from, you know, being a guy with an extremely Jewish name at National Review and that annoying certain people. But um, the broader question, I think that part of the problem is that this happened, you know, it's it's a little like the Hemingway bankruptcy thing, right? It was gradual and then sudden. Right. So there have been these arguments, not necessarily sub rosa, but no one paid much attention to them. The post colonial oppressor oppressed stuff be going on all over the place. Um, we've witnessed intellectually the supplanting of class based leftism for identity politics, intersectional, you know, uh, leftism. That is the ruling paradigm. And, um, and I think that the anti-Israel movement benefited from the rise of to prominence of, of this oppressor oppressed ideology stuff that when given a prompting, it kicked into overdrive very quickly. And you add in the sort of protest cosplay culture of American campuses and plus bad actors from abroad. I mean, and like, you know, people were bad and, and from at home, you know, I mean, like, uh, the spontaneous ownership of very expensive tents um, on campuses by hundreds of people all over the country was not an accident, right? But um, so it's a confluence of different different things that came to a head. But I'm very much of the view that, like, if you take the DEI logic, you know, the extreme version of the DEI logic seriously, then Jews pose a real problem for it. Because if any, if, if, if disproportional pro disproportionate problems are proof of bigotry because the system's rigged, then disproportionate success is a proof the system's rigged too, and that is very quick to lead to all sorts of classic anti-Semitic tropes. Uh, you know, if the system's rigged for the benefit of the few, and Jews disproportionately succeed in a meritocracy or in free market or whatever, then aha, guess who's who's rigging the system? And I think that that kind of logic scales in all sorts of ways to the UN and to the global scene. Israel's disproportionate success as being a prosperous democracy in a neighborhood that lacks prosperity and lacks democracy feeds the same sort of connect the dots nonsense. And um, so I think it was, it, it, it's, you know, it was bad timing given where the intellectual left-wing ferment was on American campuses and elsewhere. It's also bad timing given the prominence that a bunch of more traditionally horrible anti-Semites on the right were. Um, you know, the resurgence of the sort of classic sort of neo-Nazi stuff being sort of one foot in the popular front of the new right um, was inconvenient as well. And so it's sort of an overdetermined thing and, and just the utter lack of courage by the vast majority of people who don't subscribe to either point of view, but 
are not willing to, particularly at these elite institutions, it very much reminds me of like the guns on campus crisis at Cornell University in 1969, where all the vital central liberals were like, we cannot, we cannot give in to violent intimidation and death threats and all that kind of stuff. And then they gave in to violent intimidation and death threats, right? Clinton Rossiter, I think there's a plausible case committed suicide because of his capitulation to all of that. And we saw these institutions that are supposed to be incredibly principled about tolerance and all these kinds of things fail utterly in their mission precisely because Jews do not fit the actual intellectual ideological paradigm at those places. And that was very telling and very scary for a lot of secular Jews who really thought they were part of the, you know, of that coalition and of, of on that team. And then all of a sudden they find out that you can go to some sort of re-education therapy or be expelled or suspended for saying men can't get pregnant. Um, but it's complicated and we got to hear both sides when someone says gas, the Jews. And, uh, that freaked out a lot of people. I mean, I, it's, it's, I, 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 I want to remind that, that the gas, the Jews thing was not merely children of the campus phenomenon, but it was, it, that, that specific cry was heard around the world in many protests by right. people of varying ages. And, um, I, I always worry that, too much is attributed strictly to the over intellectualization and the the internally contradictory or, or the doom spiral of post colonial thinking and not to a, a much simpler ideology that has just taken root and it's is that's uh, fair and also and also Iran and these countries seeding this stuff you know Russia and Iran right you pay for people to promote this stuff and then they get and I think social media helps create the sense that it's a movement and you also have a huge arab and muslim diaspora that has brought with it a lot of i mean so it's an overdetermined phenomenon i agree i didn't mean to leave out all um i i do want to before um um we go to uh charlotte just to flip back to see how how this entire uh, horror um played out in israel over the past year uh just to stay on the question of of diaspora jews um how do we deal with the question that has been asked for, I mean, for years, but really has been over um, indulged over the past year of really figuring out if the 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 threat, the risk, is it really to, towards Jews is or is it about quote unquote Zionism? Is it about Israeli Israelis? Is it about Western culture? Where is what does it mean when people hold a sign that shows the uh, a swastika and the Star of David. Does that mean that they're anti-Semitic? Does that mean that they associate the the state of Israel with the new uh, oppressors? How do we adjudicate that? I think you know the Venn diagram, uh, you know, uh, exists. There might be some people who uh, do certain things like that who aren't anti-Semitic, but it's a pretty large crossover. Um, you, you mean you maybe take it on a case by case basis, but I think generally. Those who are saying anti zion you know, they're anti-Zionist, they're saying this right of Israel doesn't exist. And, you know, it's, you, you go back to Bill Buckley's The, the Case for Anti-Semitism. I think his argument with Pat Buchanan was against. on a personal level. Against, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> 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 that would be very thought, different. As a 20-year National Review guy, I thought it's kind of important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think his, his argument against Bill Buckley was on a personal level, Bill Buckley uh, and I think a lot of Jews would say it was very nice, but but broadly his ideology was uh, was you know what he was saying uh, crossed over into anti-Semitism. So you know people that are going around saying uh, you know, they're anti-Zionist, maybe on a personal level, if you had coffee with them, uh, are very nice. But but broadly what they're espousing, I think, crosses over into anti-Semitism. And, and just one story. I mean, I remember being in uh, Italy maybe twenty some years ago, right after I graduated high school, I think, on a family trip. And we had a guide and he was very nice. Uh, somehow he came to Israel and, uh, you know, he said, they're just like Nazis. And I said, well, how are they like Nazis? They go, they've killed people. I go, well, I don't know if that's like what the, the, the attribute that made people Nazis, Nazis, I guess everybody, I mean, it, you know, it, it was almost when it came to Israel, because it's a Jewish state, he wants to, he wants to ascribe Nazism to something all states do in defense of themselves. Um, they yeah, are, Hitler they, loved dogs. Yes, I mean, there's an element there that almost is 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 mania that 
that was anti-Jewish in his mind, even though on a personal level, very friendly. But but on a, on a broader level, he had this animus that seemed to you know, be directed towards Israel. But you know, why would the only Jewish state the be the state you ascribe Nazism to somebody who to a state that does things that every state would do in defense of them? So. Um, yeah, I, I would have been I would have been a lot more patient to some of the arguments that this is not really about what it seems if on October 8th, the outpouring was so unequivocally pro-Israel, even if, even if the statement was Israel should restrain itself from responding to Gaza because of the ultimate disproportionality of force between the IDF and Hamas and Israel should show, uh, should be the better, bigger player or whatever, at minimum showing consideration to the fact that it suffered a horrific pogrom and it should be yeah. treated as a tragedy on an international level. Charlotte, how all this discourse, did that even make a dent in Israeli psyche or did the Israelis just flip the war switch on and, and did not give a rat's ass about diaspora Jews? I would say it definitely reached people here. And it was also covered pretty extensively in Hebrew media. These these massive protests in the United States against Israel's right to defend itself. And I think on some level it was demoralizing, but I think on another level, this last war or this last year of war in Israel has kind of been about dealing with the immediate threats to the country, Hamas and now Hezbollah. And Israel's never been particularly interested in or adept at fighting the war of public opinion. To me, it feels like it's it's focusing on the threats on its border, and that's definitely what dominates most of the public consciousness. Sure, I read. I went back and read your first dispatch for the Morning Dispatch, and uh, you know, incidentally, it's interesting that you talk about the rockets being fired from Lebanon uh, already, which uh, you know seems now is a conversation like, you know, why is Israel Israel going into right right after? You know, uh, uh, October seventh, just like a lot of people were already calling genocide, Hezbollah was already firing rockets. But I, I'm kind of intrigued uh, since you've been there this entire time. What what is life like October sixth versus the post October eighth world in Israel? I think one important thing to understand is just how divided Israeli society was in the lead up to October seventh. Um, throughout the first half of 2023, there were massive protests over the government's efforts to reform or overhaul, according to some people, the judiciary. Some of the biggest protests and the biggest feeling of division that's, that Israel's felt in its in its history. So I think what October 7th did unify Israelis by reminding them of that external threat. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that unity came from what Adam mentioned, which was the absence of an Israeli state for a moment. A lot of civil society kind of came together and fulfilled basic functions of the state, like compiling lists of people who were missing after October 7th and trying to field donations to get equipment, soldiers. So some of that unity has faded, but you can kind of still see signs of it. But I think one of the biggest lasting impacts of the last year is Israelis now are much more willing to kind of take risks in order to degrade threats on their border. Can I just follow up? I mean, one of the most remarkable things about Israeli society, it's a, you know, being a citizen soldier society, is that, you know, Despite all these massive risks that we knew about, or they knew about, um, I think they're the fourth or fifth happiest people in the world by rankings. Uh, you go to Tel Aviv; it's you know one of the most vibrant, vibrant places. Has that changed? Has it come back? I mean, if you go to Tel Aviv now, can you, can you can, do you go out and and you know, despite you know wars going on on many different fronts, you still might find people on the beaches or in the in the in in the bars. Yeah, I think. I think there's been some rebound. I think kind of letting Israel become this war zone where people don't go out, don't enjoy life would be giving Hamas what it wanted when it attacked on October 7th. But at the same time, a lot of Israelis are still living on October 7th in a sense that they're still thinking about the people who died that day and who are still held captive in Hamas. It's definitely an enduring trauma in that sense. Yeah, I think we'd be remiss if we don't, you know, mention there's still hostages in 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 Gaza as we 
speak a year later. Um, jo Joan, how do you think October 7th will be remembered? I mean, if we're, if we're talking a decade from now and talking October 7th, do we know yet? Or, or you know, does it depend on the outcome of Israel's wars? Or do you think there's a, there's a clear way we will remember it a decade from now? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the facts will be remembered as the facts, right? Um, you know, in the same way that the assassination of Gavril Princip, you know, that launched World War One, the facts of the assassination are, are remembered as the facts of the assassination. The well, significance that's a, that's a big assumption based on the uh, trend of revisionism that we're already facing. Yeah, well, fair, fair. But I, I have some faith that, like, the broad outlines, Hamas launched an attack. A lot of people ki were killed and, and raped and kidnapped and those kinds of facts. As Sani Sikots put it, uh, Hamas broke out of Gaza and consequently a thousand Israelis died. Yes, but Tana Sikots is not an honest um, chronicler of facts. Um, and I'm going to just leave it there. Um, I have this big, you know, uh, theory about how, you know, the present can change the future, but the, the present can, but the present can also change the past. Right. And so the example I often use is like during the height of the war on terror stuff after nine 11, 1917, which for most of my childhood and in young adult life was the most significant, arguably one of the most significant dates of the 20th century, really kind of started to, to fade into the background. Cold War was over. And all of a sudden, like 1922, which I think is the year that the Salafists took over Mecca and, and Saudi Arabia and all that, um, or the year that, uh, or you could say maybe the year that FDR worked out the deal with the Saudis. Um, those kinds of dates all of a sudden became much more important, right? So like the present actually changes our views of the past in all sorts of ways. Um, if this, and I think there are a lot of steps between here and there, but like if in 10 years people look back and say, you know, this is what led to the downfall of the Mullahs in Iran, people look at it as like a, a tragic event that led maybe to a good thing. Um, if it launches a wider regional war where lots of people die, uh, you know, I, I, I just think, I, I don't know. I mean, I honestly, I don't know how it's going to be written because, you know, in the way that our old friend Charles Krauthammer used to say, decline is a choice. Um, the significance of October 7th is a choice too. How does Israel respond to it? How do the regional powers respond to it? How do... Um, two different, very soon, two different American administrations respond to it and the events that unfolded from it remains to be seen. I mean, Joe Biden responded to it a bunch of different ways already. Um, and we're dealing with those consequences. So I think the hopeful scenario is it leads to something like what we were talking about, what I was bringing up about, you know, regime change, hopefully regime change from within in Iran um, and rapprochement and ultimately acceptance of Israel's existence in the region. But that's something that requires a lot of legwork between now and that conclusion. And a lot of things can go really bad before that happens. Charlotte, I, let me just free frame it as we close uh, soon. Um, formatively, I, I believe, I don't know if this is your first uh, reporting experience or foreign reporting experience, but, but certainly early, early on in, in uh, your, your journalism life, how will covering something as traumatic as this, do you think that, will, will that carry on? Do you, do you imagine this staying with you as, as being uh, something impactful for you that you covered? Or how do you think this, this, this formative experience covering something so traumatic will, will stay with you as a writer and a journalist? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It's, I mean, I was in the South actually earlier this week and a year later, you can still kind of see you can still definitely see the destruction that happened that day. And certainly when I came to Israel over a year ago now, it's not something I expected to cover. Actually, I came here hoping to report a lot about um, Saudi Arabia normalization and kind of the overall integration of Israel into the region. It was a more hopeful path. Um, October 7th just completely changed the dynamics of the region. So it, it changed the dynamics of, of my reporting and the kind of stories I was pursuing. But yeah, definitely it's a war like this is something that kind of 
sticks with you. And I know a lot of people started their careers reporting on Iraq and the Syrian civil war. But yeah, I think if anything, this is maybe a more transformative moment for the Middle East. So it'll be interesting to continue to cover it and see where it comes from, goes from here. I, I, I want to, oh, sorry. No, I, I, want, I want to just make sure that we end on a grimmer note. Um, <laughs> To to your um, a question that you addressed to Jonah about how will this be remembered, I want to suggest how it might be remembered at least in Israel. I I have, I think I have a lot less optimism than Jonah that even the facts will transcend, let alone memory of the event ever existing with our ever shrinking attention spans. Um, but with the w- within Israel, it will certainly be remembered. But I'm afraid that it will be remembered as the day in which the Israeli soul truly darkened and by and, and that not by um you know the malevolence of the Netanyahu regime but by the necessity of the moment i think the fact that we still have who knows how many hostages still alive in gaza civilians who are in cellars and trenches in in tunnels, hidden, possibly tortured, possibly worse. And this is not the only thing that we as Israelis think about constantly, where two years ago, we would have thought of ourselves as the people who will empty out our prisons in order to get one soldier back. We are now basically accepting the fact that these people, these civilians kidnapped from a music festival, from their homes, children, elderly, might languish underneath the rubbles of Gaza. I think that in itself is already such a profound change in how Israelis understand themselves. I asked a friend who was uh, going out in the uh, weekly protest against Netanyahu, um, uh, accusing Netanyahu for uh, having blood on his hands for not doing more to release the hostages. And I asked him, what more did you expect Netanyahu to do? It's, it does not, there's no real indication that Hamas is sincere about trying to get the deal on their end. It's not clear that we should do we should exit Philadelphia strategically, whatever. The terms of the deal are not obviously sensical for Israel to accept, even for such a cost. And he says, like, I, I agree with everything you said. Strategically, it might be a horrible deal, but I can't allow ourselves to become the people who are just allow our own brethren to die in captivity. We need to show that we are not that, that we are the Israel that we believe ourselves to be. And I thought that was heartbreaking because I understand the sentiment that he was expressing. But I, as I, again, I think I mentioned that already on October 7th, when we, when we talked to Jonah, I just don't think Israel can be that anymore. Adam, can, can I just uh, maybe end on a positive note? I think there's an alternative way that we may remember one of the ways we remember it, um, or one of the consequences of it. Um, I believe you're going to supercharge, and it's great we have Dan Senor as part of this uh, uh, this this extended episode. I think you're going to supercharge the startup society because you have another generation of Israelis who were kind of uh, forced to uh, engage in this awful conflict, have to be innovative in a way to fight uh, you know enemies on many different fronts, while the world, in many cases, turn against them, and they will uh, ultimately, hopefully, be victorious go back to society, become more, be more adult-like, be more innovative, and create uh, uh, even, e- an even more innovative Israeli society uh, than we've seen before. At least that's what I think. I think you're going to have a whole new generation uh, of, of innovators in Israel. Um, Definitely experiencing a-, a booming wireless communications technology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, um, I see what you did there. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't quite <laughs> Uh, exactly. Yes, we're going to bring back the pagers too. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I um, in this dark time, I, I'm actually optimistic for for the Israel that emerges from it. Um, but uh, maybe I am uh, always tend towards optimism. Yeah, I, I just I mean to push back a little on on that as well. I you can still be have an idealistic and proud and very humane self conception of your of yourself as a people, right? Of the Israeli people, of the Jewish people, and not 
live up to the standard of trading thousands of murderers for the remains of one soldier or whatever, you know, those kinds of deals. There's a, I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but there's a real luxury and a kind of virtue signaling luxury involved in saying that if we don't live up to that ideal, we're not a good and righteous people. Right. Um, that is a stand, you know, we, we talk, I spend a lot of time talking about the unfair double standards imposed on Israel by its enemies. There are some unfair, crazy double standards imposed on Israel by its friends and by Israelis themselves. And the idea that all of a sudden it's a binary choice, you are a dark and evil people, or you willingly trade living terrorists who've murdered 10x Israelis for one soldier or the remains of one soldier or any of that kind of stuff, that those are your choices, I kind of reject. Like, America's done a lot of bad things in its history. Some of them were necessary evils. Some were just evils. I still think this is a good and decent country. Israel has done some things that I'm sure get five Jews in a room, you'll get 10 people complaining about them. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad people on their souls of so turned I, dark. I, I want to clarify that my when I talk about the darkening of the, the souls, I don't mean in the Yom Kippur sense as something that we need to atone for, answer to God for. I mean that this is the self-conception that allows the it allows most Israeli society to commit the generational sacrifice of sending your kids to the military and not just as a matter of symbolic service, but knowing that your children might die. A lot of the, a big piece of the social contract that Israelis have with the state is that radical commitment to the lives of the children that are being sent to either live right across from murderers or into enemy line across enemy lines and what i worry that sh showing that we are we've reached the point where this commitment is no longer sustainable could change the way that israelis are willing to put themselves out there to to the, the change the logic of solidarity and potentially make a lot of israelis less committed to the whole project fair enough I mean, that's, that's real. Which arguably is also the entire design of Hamas <laughs> and right. certainly of Iran and, and the, the late Nasrallah. Well, what you, lose in the, what you lose in the powerful carrot of utopian idealistic motivations, you might compensate for with the sense of the peril of survival. Mm. Right. I mean, that's, 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 that's also a good motivation. And, um, might get you through this period. I don't know, but like I mean, let me, know... let me. I mean, I guess close to the end, but I mean, I, I guess I just don't see the the dichotomy. I mean, Israel has t bombing Osirak. They weren't sure any of the pilots would come back. I mean, they sent people on missions with these grievous choices that 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 they had that you had to make. Uh, I mean, I I'm not sure where I see that they gave up on the the children of of you know uh, fighting in the wars here. I mean. I guess I don't see where you're see you're seeing this this darkness uh, that that Israel gave up on on people. I think it's all go it all goes to what Jonah was saying about the impossible standards that Israelis, as Israelis, we hold ourselves to, and I just don't know what it means to live in an Israel where we are no longer able to do that. And I don't think it's trivial because I think a lot of the success, a lot of the strength of Israel was the possible standards and realizing our own incapability in the face of such evil coming from Hamas come, be, being populated from Iran I don't know what it would mean when what how Israel redefined itself it might be for the better it might be a little dark well, with with that um Adam Jonah and Charlotte uh, thank you for joining uh, this commemoration of October 7th